Good evening, everyone. My name is J.P. Jones, and I'm the Don Bennett Moon Dean of the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences. And I want to welcome you to the fourth virtual presentation in our series on women power, the eighth annual downtown lecture series. In previous weeks, you've heard Kate Bernheimer talk about imagination and women's empowerment across generations in fairy tales. And you've heard Elise Lopez talk about the culture of skepticism and debates over consent and gender-based violence, both on and off campus. And you've heard Lisa Sanchez talk about stories and data related to Latino women attempting to break through the political glass ceiling. Tonight, you're going to hear a great talk by Dr. Sanja Lanhart on African-American women's speech. But before I get started, I want to tell you where we are. We're at the carriage house of downtown Kitchen and Cocktails in downtown Tucson. This is the brainchild of Janos Wilder, an innovative and creative chef and winner of the 2000 James Beard Award for the best chef in the Southwest. Not only is he a great chef, but he's also an innovative entrepreneur and one of the pioneers in leading downtown revitalization in Tucson. He's also been an excellent supporter of SBS as we enter into our eighth annual downtown lecture series, held virtually this year, but still rooted in downtown. We all miss the old days when it was safe to come down and visit downtown Tucson and see all the diversity, the conviviality, and take part in the culinary experience of our local foodways. Once that is safe, I encourage you to come to downtown Kitchen and Cocktails and to come to the other businesses, bars, restaurants, music venues, and art houses in our vibrant downtown Tucson. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to give a special thanks to our major sponsor, Mike and Beth Kasser and Palua Companies. Mike and Beth have not only been big sponsors of SBS and our move downtown, but of course, supporters of theater and the arts um, across Tucson for many years. I'd also like to give a special shout out and gratitude to Ken and Linda Robin for their support and to Dr. Barbara Starrett and Joanne Ellison, also sponsors of this series. Tonight's speaker, Dr. Sonja Lanhart, is a new arrival to the University of Arizona, coming to us from the University of Texas at San Antonio. She holds three positions at the University of Arizona, Professor of Linguistics in the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, Professor of Teaching, Learning, and Sociocultural Studies in the College of Education, and Faculty Fellow in the Graduate College. Already in a short time, and even under COVID, she's become really well known on our campus. Sanja has a PhD from the University of Michigan, trained in English literature and linguistics. She is a sociolinguist and more generally studies the relationship between identity and language. More specifically, she focuses on language pedagogy and in particular its impact on African American communities. And she studies the historical and social aspects of English language variation, particularly that of African American women. Theoretically, she draws on linguistics and education, but also black feminist theory and critical race studies. She has a long list of articles and book chapters and five books, including the Oxford Handbook of African American Literature and Sista Speak, Black Women Kinfolk Talk About Language and Literacy. She's received funding from the Mellon Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the National Science Foundation. I mentioned that she is well known on campus. 
and it's partly because of an outstanding record of service to professional organizations, to public outreach, and to departments, colleges, and universities, including the University of Arizona, where she has pushed us in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Sonja is also a mentor to many young scholars of color, helping them shape the next generation's anti-racist agenda for social justice, equity, and inclusion. I know you're going to enjoy tonight's talk. Thank you. Thank you, JP, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me to be a part of the SBS Downtown Lecture Series. In this presentation, we will examine the several ways African-American women use language to tell the truth and shame the devil. African-American women's language is not black male speech as spoken by women, and it's not white women's speech as spoken by African-American women. It represents the intersectional lives and identities of black women who continue to talk that talk in spite of everything that tries to silence them. I provide a graphic here for you to represent a range of black women. Black women have started loving themselves loudly and that makes some people very uncomfortable. Were we supposed to wait for you to love us? Now, African-American language has generally focused on African-American men and in particular, teenage boys. The basic definition for African-American language that I use is language spoken by or among African-Americans. I wrote a whole book about it called The Oxford Handbook of African-American Language. And then one of my favorite authors talks about the significance of African-American language without specifically using that term, Toni Morrison. She says, the language, only the language, it's the thing that black people love so much. The saying of words, holding them on the tongue, experimenting with them, playing with them. It's a love, a passion. The words of all possible things, that could, the worst of all possible things could happen would be to lose that language. There are certain things I cannot say without recourse to my language. So I've played with that definition of African-American language to tell you about African-American women's language. So instead, I'm going to say African-American women's language is language, discourse, paralinguistics that are used by or among African-American women. In essence, it's everything that we think about when we're talking about people communicating with one another. And I wrote a book for that too, African-American Women's Language. And notice the difference in the book jacket. So in the first book jacket, I have, it's a bit more muted, but for African-American Women's Language, I wanted to have the vibrancy of how African-American women interact in their discourse communities. And I thought that this particular work worked well. So my very first book was called Sis to Speak. And on this cover is a picture of my grandmother who represented African-American women's language better than anyone that I can think of. Her stance, her expression, just her overall appearance just speaks to me as this is what black women look like and what black women do. And hence the title, Sister Speak. In order to have you engage with what I'm talking about and why I'm talking about it, I think it's really important for you to understand who I am. Uh, it's something that I encourage in all my classrooms and all my, with all my students, and it's something that I try to do in most talks that I give so that people understand why this is important to me. I've used a simple wordle to express that, and as you can see, African American is the most prominent aspect of who I am but there are all sorts of things that make up who I am and how I got to be who I am and where I'm at and why I do the things that I do. This is a picture of my family, uh, or at least a picture of some people in my family. Uh, but as you can tell, there is a, an array of folks uh, that I have grown up with and who have influenced my life, none more 
than the matriarchs in my family. Uh, as I said, from the cover of Sisters Speak, there's another picture of my grandmother when she's older. Uh, and I also have my paternal grandmother on this picture as well, uh, in a picture that for me represents that same sort of Black women, right? African American women's language uh, in what she is speaking through that dress and holding her purse on her way to church in her all white, as we have known uh, Black women do uh, in the South on Sunday mornings. But then there's also a picture with me and my mom at the bottom where we were visiting the prices right. Uh, and boy, was a lot of language used that day as we were cheering. Another group of women who influenced me and have helped me to grow in terms of thinking about African-American women's language and actually just being a black woman or a woman of color are my favorite thing, sisters. Uh, as you can see, we are both black and brown, uh, but they have had one of the greatest impacts on my lives as a scholar and as a human being and becoming a woman and understanding what sisterhood means. More pictures, because we actually celebrate a lot and we celebrate being women of color and the language that we use, the ways that we interact, the communities that we come from. My other group is my sister supper club. You notice a theme. Uh, this is a group of women who are on the family side of my life because we got together because of our kids uh, and the relationships uh, that they had as going and being college students. And so we would go to dinner once a month. And here are a few pictures of that. And then I'm also an academic, and I have an academic family. I mentor students, and I'm mentored by elders and ancestors in my community. And these are those instances in which I've interacted with people in settings uh, that have brought me joy and hopefully some learning and uh, good food in some occasions as well. Uh, and I call some of them my academic kids, and I have, and they have kids, so I call them my academic grandkids. Uh, and one of my favorite pictures that I had to include on here is from the first student I graduated, uh, or, or who got her doctoral degree with me at the very bottom, me wearing my Michigan Go Blue, uh, and she wearing her University of Georgia graduation regalia, and it is the biggest smile ever. Uh, but that for me just represents black joy. And I am so thankful for those opportunities and those moments and all of these people who have come together with me to explore African-American language in general, and in particular, African-American women's language. In the bottom corners, top left and bottom right are the linguista sisters. Uh, you can see I really like sista. I probably should call it sister language. That way you'd really know that it's African-American women's language. So in talking about African-American women's language, there are lots of ideas that we have, right? So for me, one of them is people tend to think about sort of this superhero. And there's no greater woman superhero, and certainly black woman superhero, than Serena Williams, the best women's tennis player, maybe the best tennis player ever on the planet who, had, who came from very humble means, right, to dominate the tennis world on both the men's and the women's sides in terms of records. Uh, and I love this picture of her because it so represents what I think we often think of when we think about black women. And while that may be a trope that needs to be disabused, it's also a symbol of the resilience and the power of the language and community that we have. Now, other things you might think about for African-American women's language might be this idea of sort of uh, sassiness, right? Or even down to earth, right? Or no holds barred, right? Uh, or maybe even just thinking of this idea of just being direct. Black women speak their minds and they're gonna tell you what they think and you will know immediately and not have to guess. But in the end, I hope you remember to keep calm and to love an educated Black woman. And that's what you were going to engage. So I thought a lot about this talk, and I went back and forth on how I wanted to pitch the very ideas um, that I think, some, at least some, some things that undergird what I think about when I think about African-American language. And in the midst of doing this, 
Lo and behold, on October 7th, 2020, we had a vice presidential debate between Senator Kamala Harris and Vice President Mike Pence, where <laughs> I would say Kamala Harris displayed many of the ways African American Women's Language, or AAWL, was on full display in the midst of opposition. That opposition came from what I call in my linguistics research, a wham, a white, cishet, uh, and male uh, person who decided that they were going to be the dominant voice in that room, despite being in debate in which by its nature, at least two people get to talk. And by now, we probably all have seen, and we all remember, uh, and we all have seen uh, GIFs and uh, memes and the like of Kamala Harris repeatedly having to say, Mr. Vice President, I am speaking. These are the faces of Kamala Harris. Uh, and they range from a variety of ways in which we can talk about this engagement with African-American women's language. And I want you to keep these faces in mind, although I'm going to give you some other ones, but we're going to start with Kamala because she's Kamala. So Kamala Harris is every Black woman who has tried to stay calm while she was being lied about. She's every Black woman who has had to remain silent while an unqualified white man shouted over them. She's every Black woman who has gritted her teeth to hide frustration because she knows eyes are on her, judging her every move. She's every black woman who's had to grin and bear abuse while others just watched. Kamala Harris is every black woman who smiles through their suffering of fools and injustice. And that brings me to the first aspect that I wanna talk about for African-American women's language, laughter. So black women laugh in a variety of ways to express a range of emotions. It's not just, oh, I'm feeling great. It's a wonderful joke you just made, or I'm so happy, right? There are different types of laughter, and that laughter can underlie a range of emotions, such as, I'm thinking about Zora Neale Hurston's quote, sometimes I feel discriminated against, but it doesn't make me angry. It merely astonishes me. How can any deny themselves the pleasure of my company? It's beyond me. And you kind of see the smirk that's on her face, right? Yeah, she's thinking, I'm all that, but you're missing out. There's an article written on the hidden message in Kamala Harris's smile, right up my alley for talking about African-American women's language, because I know that la laughter for black women signifies a range of other things. And I thought about some of the people who have these smiles. So I captured uh, Chimamanda Adichie, who's giving a sort of, yeah, I'm gonna be nice and polite right now. And then there's a full-throated laugh, right, um, that we have coming from Maya Angelou. And then I've had the pleasure of meeting Nick Ivan Nikki Giovanni, and I can say that any smile from Nikki Giovanni should be one that you think about with in suspect motives in the sense that her smiles belie a range of emotions that you may or may not get. And part of that has to do with this idea of laughter as signifying from African-American women. And part of understanding that is being acculturated into that discourse community. Uh, and one of the reasons that I talk about this as African-American women's language is I want you to know that I'm focusing on women and not girls or children, because the language that African-American girls use is a precursor to what they will get to as women, but they go through some different stages. For them, laughter may just be laughter, but when you're a grown woman and fill in the blank in between those, uh, your laughter becomes a little bit more complex. It overcomes the childish games, right? That full-throated laughter. It overcomes, the. it's used to overcome all of the pain and hurt that black women have to experience. When you are talking about a situation where I think about with my grandmother who for 
a lot of her life was raising her kids as a single parent, uh, in some cases escaping physical abuse, uh, in many cases being on her own because her parents died when she was young and she went from sibling to sibling, had to drop out in the third grade and worked as a domestic all of her life. Uh, my mom often talks about how she doesn't know the pain that my grandmother suffered because there were just things that she wouldn't say. But my grandmother still laughed. She cried sometimes, but she mostly laughed. And that's the laughter I remember. But I also understand the pain that was behind that laughter sometimes. And I think about that for these women and the lives that they have lived or are living um, and the experiences that they've had as being Black women and understanding the differences in those laughs to understand the pain or the joy or the hurt or the pride or whatever it may be in just a slight hint of difference in the laughter that they express. The next idea that I want to talk about in African American women's language is this idea of little. So little was talked about by Gwendolyn Etter Lewis in a series of interviews that she did with, I believe it's probably about 100 women or more, black women or more, who had accomplished great things. But even though they'd accomplished great things, they always seemed to subjugate their particular achievements to someone else, mostly their fathers or other men. Uh, so even for women who say like Mae Jemison in going into outer space, we think about this as that's a little thing I did. And so there's this idea of it's, oh, thank you for the love, but I'm shrieking, shrinking underneath it because it's just a little thing. And I really didn't do this that much. And it's just kind of small. So we'll move on with that. And then I think about people who accomplished great things like Shirley Chisholm, who in this picture I look at and I know her voice and I know what she stood for as the first black woman running on a major, who, who sought to run on the major party ticket, right? In this picture, I look at her and I think that she's looking somewhat, I don't know, dismayed, um, not quite sure, but also kind of innocent and not understanding the sort of weight of the moment that she's in. And not that she didn't think about that, but this picture for me represents this idea of little. That this is a woman who did something great, who did something amazing with her voice, with her actions, with just her existence and being who she is. She is the precursor for a lot of what we see right now, especially if we look to the people next to her, which are the, the uh, founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Colors Khan. Uh, these are three queer women who started a movement. And I see the same thing sort of in this picture when I look at them, that I see this sort of, oh, you know, we did this little thing but they've done something that has created one of the largest civil rights movements in the history of this nation. And it has done great things and it's doing great things. But this idea that what we as black women do and how we use that in our language to sometimes diminish what we've accomplished, to diminish what we've done in order oftentimes to hold up others, and in particular, black men. And I love black men. Uh, my father's a black man. My brother's a black man, right? Um, but sometimes when we, talk, when we look at black women and their language, this is what happens. That they have been trained to give to community first. And I think if we look back at why I'm here now, and what I do, what I do, and thinking about these pictures of ancestral women for me, that in the end, it's about us coming together as women, but more so, it seems that we use our ways of being and our ways of discourse in service to the larger community. 
And sometimes in doing that, that diminishes the voice that we have, that we, the, accomplishes, the accomplishments that we've made as Black women, because we do it in service of, right? And we can certainly see that over the course of history and looking at civil rights movements where you probably know Malcolm and Martin, but you may not have even heard of Shirley Chisholm uh, or a host of other women, a host of other Black women. Girl Trek. Girl Trek is one of the largest health Black women's health organizations that has ever existed. Their goal, at least a primary goal for now, is to get one million Black women moving in the same direction. Because when Black women get together and do things, they do great things, even when they think about it as just a little something that they did. Now, I know you're probably very familiar with this idea about Black women's language and Black women and anger, right? There's this trope of the angry Black woman. A couple of years ago, I was at a conference. A mentor of mine, uh, after, as I was talking, at the, end, at the end asked, was I concerned that I would be viewed as an angry Black woman? And I said, well, I think I have every right to be angry, but I don't think that I walk in anger. I think that anger well, you know what? Maybe it's just kind of like the Hulk, right? I'm a big sci-fi fan. I didn't include a picture of my nerdiness, uh, but it definitely is a part of what I do and, and how I look at language. And in part of that, I'm a big Marvel fan as well. And if you remember in the last Avengers movie or the series of Avengers movie, Hulk says the trick is he's always angry, right? So I think you can have anger, but it's controlled. And I think that anger is used in order to move things forward and to actually expand the conversation. And I can't think of any people who expand the conversation more as Black women than Toni Morrison, Nina Simone, and Michelle Obama. Toni Morrison, from the quote that I used earlier, has used her literature and her platform, or at least she did before passing, to move a conversation about Black people in the history of America and Black people currently in America. And she used it in her voice. She used it in her African-American women's language, in the descriptions that she used, in the characters that she created. And she centered Black women. As a matter of fact, this particular picture of her, if I recall correctly, is from an interview that she was having in which she was annoyed by being asked why she didn't have more white characters in her books. Uh, I think her expression says it all. There were some choice words she said, but I think the expression says it all. And that's what I mean about part of what African-American women's language is, is about not just the actual words, but those discourse practices, those ways in which they use language, use every aspect of their being. Nina Simone, another woman who was fighting in spite of all of the things that she was going through. Um, she had mental disease that was undiagnosed for quite some time. Uh, she was in problematic relationships. But she had a message. She had music. And she expressed that. And one of the reasons I like this was because this is a picture from a concert that she was at in which someone says something in the audience and she just stops, right? And she just says, wait a minute, I'm the musician. I get to play the music. I get to choose the songs. If you don't like what I'm doing, you can leave, right? And there's this idea, right? right? She's out there performing, but that anger is underneath, which comes from all of the things that Black women have been told they can't do, right? We saw it with Kamala Harris and all of the time she was told, stop talking. And all of the times that she was spoken over. And all of the times that she was asked a question by someone who wasn't even the moderator in the debate, right? Which makes me look at that Toni Morrison view, right? This whole idea of sort of cut eye. I don't do it very well. My son would probably say I do it quite well. And then Michelle Obama. This is my Facebook photo. This is the photo that I use. This is the photo that will be there until I can have a different expression. 
But it's still this idea that there's this underlying anger for the injustices that I face as a black woman, as a black mother, as a black scholar, as a black everything. And I use all the resources of my language to be able to express that and to let you know, even though sometimes it may come across as little, and even sometimes it's that smirk of laughter, but underneath there's still that anger that may be there. And of course I couldn't leave without an Anna Louise Keating gift. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about for African American African-American women's language is this idea of knowing. What you want to talk about is centering this talk. Uh, knowing for me is this expression that I see in Barbara Jordan's face. She knows the law. She knows justice. She knows the South. She knows Black women. She knows suppression. She knows oppression. She knows. There is not many pictures in which I have of Barbara Jordan that I look at and I think that she doesn't know. I think Barbara Jordan is kind of all-knowing in some respects. And it's in her voice. She has, has one of the most powerful voices, the most powerful voices of a Black woman that I've ever heard. She's measured. She's calm. She's concise, and she is always on point. And it is that aspect of being a Black woman, not just in the idea of you should know your place, right, as some like to tell us, or that you should just uh, sit down and shut up, or that you don't know anything, right? Black women know. And Barbara Jordan's expression says that. I had to include Rachel Gentile in this for this expression of exasperation, but also knowing. If you don't remember, Rachel Gentile was the key witness for the Trayvon Martin murder, uh, the trial that occurred. Rachel Gentile was the last per person to speak to Trayvon Martin. She was on the phone with him. She heard him as he was being hunted. She heard him as he fought for his life. And she heard him when he was killed. And while everything in her should be angry, this picture just expresses the exasperation of a Black woman knowing, knowing what happened and knowing what's going to happen here knowing that she's not being heard no matter how much of her voice she tries to use because it didn't sound like the voices that that court was used to hearing. And research has shown from an examination of the court documents that the jury completely ignored everything this Black woman said. Not one thing was considered. She wasn't considered a good witness. She wasn't considered reliable. She wasn't considered knowledgeable or knowing. She wasn't considered smart. And in spite of that, we know the power that that testimony had, even for the people who chose not to listen to it. And we see the exasperation on her voice because she knows. I couldn't leave without a nod to Beyonce if we're talking about Black women's language. Uh, and in particular, let's talk about Lemonade. She goes through pretty much all of the things that I've talked about in terms of African-American women's language through her music and through the visuals and through the expressions. This is her cover for Lemonade, a visual album in which she knows. She knows what her husband did. She knows the Black Lives Matter movement. She knows police violence. She knows that Black women in community do great things. She knows that Black women are sometimes not heard, but she also knows that Black women have power because Black women know. And I wanted to let you see where I got the title from, which is one of my uh, favorite things, sisters, 
Kenitra Brooks, who had it tattooed on her arm uh, a few years ago. And we were all shocked, but we were also all proud because it served as a marker for us and for others that Black women be knowing. Black women know, and in spite of all of that, in spite of the laughter that they have to use, in spite of the diminutive nature that they may have sometimes to, to undercut their accomplishments for the sake of others, in spite of sometimes just having to be angry and letting that anger show, that Black women know all of these things about their language and their lives and themselves. As Audre Lorde said, however, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And that is the complexity of African-American women's language. While it's a part of African-American language, which is used by the entire African-American community, it's not homogenous, right? Not all black people are the same. Not all black women necessarily use these particular things that I've talked about today. But it's a part of a black women's struggle and a part of a black women's community. It's similar to what Chimamanda Adichie said, right? The problem with the single story, the idea that we are all the same. But I will say that what brings us together in this community is understanding that Black women have been in a particular way in this country and in this space and in the development of this language. And they have done so as a part of a community that's a part of a larger community, that's a part of a global community, right? We are a part of all of this. And in the end, I just want you to remember two things, right? Well, three. I want you to remember Black women be known, Black women matter, and vote. Thank you. I, and I, I want to add, in, if, Mr. Vice President, I'm speaking. I have to I'm speaking. In. He only want me when I'm not there. He better call Becky with the good hair. He better call Becky with the good hair. And I feel... I feel that notwithstanding the past, that... My presence here is one additional bit of evidence that the American dream need not forever be deferred. As though our lives have no meaning and no depth without the white gaze. And I've spent my entire writing life trying to make sure that the white gaze was not the dominant one in any of my books. I stand before you today as a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency of the United States of America. Disappointed, upset, angry, questioned, and mad. My, my job is to somehow make them curious enough or persuade them by hook or crook to get more aware of themselves and where they came from and what they are into and what is already there and just to bring it out. Look at the brothers who are successful. Look at them. Most of the brothers who have made it got white women on their arms. Absolutely. Okay? In order to go up that little ladder to success, seems like you got to have Miss Thing you know on your why. arm. Mm -hmm. Their responsibility mm -hmm. level isn't the same That's as ours. It's not a question of responsibility, it's just a fundamental disrespect. Disrespect for women. We made it, y'all. Right. Look at us. We're ready to get on the wine train. But they say they were asked to get off the train after a passenger complained. Noise is going to come along with that. It's laughter. It's fun. We were paraded through um, with all the passengers looking at us. Even an 84-year-old member of their group escorted off. Police standing by.
She cannot be in that bedroom with her wig on because women don't go to bed with their wigs on. And I said, a whole portion of women out there are marginalized. I want to be a real woman. Let's go for it. I'm a character actress, okay? <laughs> What struck me was this. She had felt sorry for me even before she saw me. Her default position toward me as an African was a kind of patronizing, well-meaning pity. Walking through pain is what we have always done. My mom, she's in the middle right there. My mom desegregated her high school in 1955. Her mom walked down the steps of an abandoned school bus where she raised 11 kids as a sharecropper. And her mom stepped onto Indian territory, fleeing the terrors of the Jim Crow South. The law, the law was like that ambulance that shows up and is ready to treat Emma only if it can be shown that she was harmed on the race road or on the gender road, but not where those roads intersected. So when they say, why do you burn down the community? Why do you burn down your own neighborhood? It's not ours. We don't own anything. We don't own anything. There is, Trevor Noah said it so beautifully last night. There's a social contract that we all have, that if you steal or if I steal, then the person who is the authority comes in and they fix the situation. But the person who fixes the situation is killing us. So the social contract is broken. Many people wonder where my secret lies. I'm not cute or built to suit a fashion model size. When I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. I say, it's in the reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips. I'm a woman, phenomenally.